Hey, good evening, everybody. <laughs> uh, Semi Thunder here. Welcome back to Four Collectors for Collectors. Um, this is going to be a really interesting one, I think. Uh, this I don't know if y'all have uh, watched Cracking Cooperstown or listened to it in your car or listened to it on your headphones. I've done it all. I've watched, listened, and um, it's always a delight to hear these guys talk. So I'm here with None other than the Crack and Cooperstown duo. You have Jake on my right and Dom right below both of us. Hello, Jets. What's up, Sammy? Thanks, Sammy, for having us. Absolutely. Um, so tonight, for those that are curious, because um, I uh, we, we came up with this concept last minute because um, I was having a difficult time trying to come up with that idea, but I think this one's really going to sink in nicely with everybody. So the concept is, is that I wanted to talk a little bit with these guys about their podcast because I think it's a really engaging one. If you are listening, like I am in the car, driving long distances to the next card show that I'm doing, and it's so it feels like I'm right there with these guys in the car, and they're just talking back and forth like, no, no, he's not a Hall of Famer. No, no way. Mm. But I will say that um, – yeah, this uh, we're gonna be doing something interesting with these guys. Uh, I asked them to pick to come up with their starting lineup of players that are not in the Hall of Fame but should be in the Hall of Fame, and it's gonna be interesting to see whether Jake and Dom overlap in any way in any position. The only thing I re I realized I did not specify was the outfield positions. I don't know if you guys did left field, right field, center field, or if you just did three outfielders. I don't know how in depth you went with that because I didn't. Oh, I, I didn't cheat. I stuck to those positions myself. But. Okay. Jay, Dom's, Dom's going to say with my positionless milestones that of course I cheated. <laughs> I went three outfielders. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, yeah, my team will just have a higher D war. It's okay. So mm -hmm. let yeah. me, I, I do want to give a little bit of a background from my perspective, and you guys can correct me on any mistakes that I make, but I just want to, like, from the episodes that I have listened to so far, my favorite one that I've listened to was probably the most recent one, which is the catcher position episode that you guys did. I think that's the most recent one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so the one great thing is that these two guys are so great at delivery at their in their, in terms of their delivery and being able to just stay on cue and not have any break in the discussion. And so a combination of Dom's meticulous research and statistical analysis of all these different players makes it makes it like, oh, I wonder who that who this guy is. He has 330 home runs, 900 RBIs, uh, 100 stolen bases, and he's a catcher. Who could it, who could it be? So, I mean, of course, that's just an example of nobody in particular, but, uh, and it's also just Dom playing on Jake's curiosities, because, uh, you know, Jake wants to know exactly who Dom is talking about. And so Jake's like, hmm, I wonder who he's, you know, is he going to stump me <laughs> and make mm -hmm. me look foolish in front of everybody? <laughs> he tries. Often. But I will say this much. Like I said, uh, it's a really engaging podcast, and I am looking forward to what the next discussion is. I would, uh, I, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have done an episode on exclusively like starting pitchers or relief pitchers, but I mean, I'm being being a pitcher in high school and an enthusiast of starting pitchers in particular, uh, a, a collector of majority of pitchers um, for cards. I'm curious to see where you guys go in that direction. But before we jump into that, I'm just curious if uh, if you guys want to add on to that and just kind of talk a little bit about your podcast. Well, Dom, based on your tagline, you want to talk about how you make me look good first. <laughs> hey, 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 it's it's uh, thankless work, but I get it done. Uh, but no, seriously, it's I appreciate the kind words, Sammy. And the catcher episode was a lot of fun. Uh, that episode was kind of inspired based off of Joe Maurer getting uh, elected on the first ballot this year uh, for the BBWAA uh, and what that means for the future of the Hall of Fame catcher position. But that concept of blind resumes and breaking down a position is something that we definitely talked about potentially doing for other positions down the road. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that you glossed over is that uh, cracking Cooperstown has a double meaning. And uh, it's not just getting into Cooperstown, like guys that are outside trying to crack the mold and get elected and have their plaque, 
but it's also Jake every single episode cracking one of his cards out of its plastic oh, prison. That's right. Uh, every yeah. single show to just continue that going. That's part of the reason uh, we we only have the episodes come out so often. Part of that is also just uh, tracking down Jake to record. That can be a whole thing, you know. I can go through his agent and really <laughs> dial in uh, months in advance when I can record with him. So mm. uh, we we have a lot of fun with that, and I always just keep riffing while he is using his pliers to crack whatever hall of fame card is out of a, uh, out of a plastic prison or slab, as you would say. <laughs> Ray shock almost made my list today of non hall of famers, but he unfortunately has a plaque in Cooperstown at the moment. So I didn't get to, didn't get to Adam. What? Shout out to everyday card collector, Jason, clearly an avid listener. He's got all the inside mm -hmm. jokes down, man. The Harold Baines support and Dom Love and Ray Shock. That's awesome. Uh, but to kind of add on to, to what Dom said, you know, if you're curious how Sammy got us on here, you know, he sucked up to us and told us how much he loved us. Um, so he got us on here to talk about our podcast. Uh, but I think the other interesting thing that Dom and I try and accomplish is uh, we both love the Hall of Fame. Uh, but definitely we also love collecting from a hall of fame perspective. Um, me with my autographs and rookie cards and vintage and Dom with his hall of fame type collecting. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the collecting aspect as well. Um, you know, what it means for guys now, what it can mean for them in the future cards to get of them. Uh, you know, the obscurity of, of vintage releases or autographs for these guys. Uh, we, we try and mix in a bit of both, uh, the collecting world and then talking the hall of fame itself. And I think the reason I think why why we work well together is because one, uh, Dom and I talk Hall of Fame and collecting very often. Uh, we're good friends, but also uh, we don't do like a weekly release. Uh, so that allows us to like really think through a topic um, and research it well and discuss it well uh, before we decide to do our next episode. So I think that is to our benefit. There's not a lot of pressure there. <laughs> I think that, yeah, that definitely helps. And, um, I mean, that's good that you guys take your time. You don't force an episode through and that shows mm -hmm. because you guys are very, um, I mean, I said this before, you're very, very meticulous about your discussion. I don't know how much of the episode in terms of dialogue is, um, already pre-planned. I, I like to think that you guys are, you guys have a strategy in mind of what you're going to discuss, but the, when it gets to when it comes time to delivering it, it's just and not. I mean, I wouldn't say improvised, but it's on. It's pretty much, you know, you're going. You're just going through the motions, and and uh, it just sounds like you can you can tell that it's been very well prepared. So, um, why don't we start off with a position? <laughs> Uh, which position do you guys want to start with? I'll let you kind of take the reins here. Yeah, it's up to you, Jake. We can go batting order one through nine, or we can go around the diamond one through nine. It's up to you. Let's, let's go around the diamond. I've, that's how I've got my stack in order. <laughs> all right. All right. So we're going to start with the catcher or a pitcher. Yeah, the pitcher would be the one spot. Right. So, so. lead us off, Jake. All right, man. I like batting lead off in real life and on cracking Cooperstown. Uh, so first the pitcher position, uh, I think throughout this, a, a couple caveats before me and Dom get into this, I know he approached his list slightly differently than me and he'll share that in a moment. Um, but I approached my list as I'm not going to pick, you know, the slam dunk guys, the no brainers. Uh, I just don't think they're as interesting to talk about. Now there's an exception to that. I do have one. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to talk about cases that you wouldn't really think about or guys that may be borderline in a lot of people's minds, but I think should be in. Um, if you watch the show, you're very, very familiar with, you know, my thought process. And I don't, I know Dom will share a little bit about his too. Um, but starting here at pitchers, so keep that in mind. Uh, the guy I'm going with is King Felix, Felix Hernandez. And that's a, a 2016 five-star on card auto of King Felix uh, in the era where he dyed his goatee blonde. So that's fun. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, but that, that's my card. And I'll talk about my automatic qualifiers and my secondary qualifiers. That's how I evaluate Hall of Famers a lot. 
And for King Felix, the reason I, I choose him, and I do believe that he should be a Hall of Famer, is he's got over 2,500 strikeouts, uh, which is a secondary qualifier for me, meaning he needs at least two secondaries. He has 2,524, uh, and he also has two pitching titles. Uh, so that's another secondary qualifier. And I do think that when he does reach the ballot, that he's going to be the first true test of what a modern pitcher could be redefined as. I think most baseball fans and a lot of guys on YouTube, I hear this, that like we've seen the last 300 game winner. Heck, have we seen the last 250 and possibly some of the last 200 game winners? Uh, because the pitching position is treated very differently uh, now as opposed to 25 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, so sneak preview for that that pitching episode, Sammy. Uh, but I think that's kind of where uh, the pitching position in terms of a Hall of Famer could be going. Uh, and in my opinion, King Felix is going to make that cut. So, Dom, what you got on King Felix? You, Tell me your thoughts on him first. Yeah, you, you know that I absolutely adore uh, King Felix Hernandez. He was one of my favorite, if not uh, my favorite American League pitcher to watch uh, growing up. Uh, I personally didn't go with modern, like super modern cases. Uh, I went with guys that have actually like, hit the ballot, but I do think King Felix is going to be a nice test for the writers to see what the future of the pitcher position is, which is a nice teaser for an episode. But a few years ago, uh, Jim Cott was elected by the era committee. Uh, and as soon as he got elected, I immediately pivoted my eyes to a guy whose name has actually been brought up a ton, even in the modern game this week. And that is Tommy John. Now, it doesn't necessarily have a positive correlation when you hear that for your team's favorite starting pitcher. His rookie is 1964 tops with Bob Chance. But Tommy John, 288 career wins. He started over 700 games in the big leagues. And if you now look at a candidate for an entire case as a contributor, being the first person to get that procedure that has extended the careers of so many pitchers to go along with over 60 war, four all-star appearances. Tommy John, he's still living as well. He he is someone that I think should get in to the Hall of Fame and is going to be right at the top of those era committee pitching considerations because I think we talked about this during one of our era committee ballot videos, but for the most part, I do think the Hall of Fame has done a pretty good job so far delivering what is a Hall of Fame pitcher and what is not. Uh, so I do think that we're going to have some testing of that going forward with the limited innings and wins and things that we typically look for in a pitcher, but Tommy John has those things over 2,200 strikeouts as well. So just a really well-rounded compiled case of a guy who is going to look like a legend as baseball continues on the way it's going. When, if he would have had 12 more wins, we're not even having this conversation. He would have been in a decade. He would have been decades. Ago. Yeah. How many seasons did Tommy John pitch? Oh man. Oh, yeah, it's like 20 that... something. Eddie, I was going to guess 22 Eddie. off the top of my head. Are you saying 26 well, years? If he's 26 it. years he pitched in. They weren't all complete seasons, though. Because he had Tommy John? Yeah, 26 yeah. years in the big leagues. I mean, Some of these guys thing, get Tommy John once and they're done. So let me ask you guys a question, though. I mean, there's, you know, there, there, are, there are critics that will say that certain players are compilers because they've been they played so mm -hmm. long. So, like, I remember I would listen to WFAN, which is like a sports radio – or is a sports radio show in New York. And Mike Francesa, who is like the Pope of New York, as they call him, mm -hmm. Mike Francesa argued that Craig Biggio is not a true Hall of Famer because he – I mean, he is in the Hall of Fame, but he's a compiler. And he got 3,000 hits because he compiled his way to get there. Is Tommy John in that same conversation as a compiler to getting that – the 200, you know, almost 300 wins. So I think me and Jake would both agree he is a compiler, but the difference between us and Mike Francesa is we don't use compiler in a negative tone because being able to go out there for 26 years and make a big league roster and make an impact in some way or the other, like that is a skill within itself, like the best ability is availability. So being able to do that for a long period of time in Craig Biggio's case, I believe there's 33 members of the 3000 hit club right now. So for him to be able to compile to that number that not a lot of people have been able to do, like, I'm not going to knock him for that. 
What yeah. was Tommy John's uh, career ERA? God, uh, I didn't know. My head had it. So three, he has three, a career three. ERA of three three four, which is like okay. that. That's like a front end starter in today's game as well. So like his numbers are going to look better and better as the years go on. Uh, when, but I'm definitely pro Tommy John for the Hall of Fame. And I'm I'm with Dom on as far as like. I don't think the the connotation of compiler is negative. Like many people do, they they hear that and think very negatively about a player. But I look at it through the lens of like you were good enough that somebody was willing to pay you millions of dollars to go play for their team that they're trying to help win. Unless you're the Oakland A's, because then you don't care about winning. Um, but as long as you're not them, you care about winning. And you know, someone was willing to pay you money to do that. You know, they're not just going to pay like me or Dom or sorry, you, Sammy, to, you know, <laughs> go out there and play Major League Baseball, uh, you know, so that you can get three more RBIs. Like that's that's not how it works. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I don't see compiling statistics because you were able to play at such a high level as in, for a long time as a negative. That's good. No, I mean, it's – it could be just New York sports media kind of gets lost in the weeds sometimes with that. So um, I guess, I mean, I was just looking at Jamie Moyer's statistics and I mean, Jamie Moyer is like, you know, he has one more run at, to his ERA over Tommy John, but very um, like 269 wins for Jamie Moyer and uh, 2,441 strikeouts. They're very similar numbers. I think Tommy John pitched more games, but uh, and then his his war is a little higher, it looks like. But uh, yeah, Jamie that's, that's, that's where – I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's, that's uh, where I think war can be used as a differentiator. I am not someone that goes full-blown sabermetrics, but I do think that they help tell part of the story that sometimes the accumulating numbers do not – and to me, 60 war is a significant threshold. I don't care if you play 26 years or 10. Uh, if you can get 60 war in your career, which is a compiling statistic, you can also be bad and get negative war. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that 60 war is a legitimate accomplishment. And that's where you start looking at someone as like a legit case versus Jamie Moyer. He compiled a very good career. Hall of very good is a, is a big buzz phrase in the community. Uh, but he doesn't have the ERA or the war that is comparable to Hall of Fame pitchers like Tommy John does. And going back to Felix Hernandez, um, I mean, as you mentioned, Jake, the, the 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 role of a starting pitcher was, I mean, evolving. I mean, obviously Tommy John more wins just because pitchers were able to kind of go further into games, and you know, with with the time frame where Felix Hernandez was in the game, it's you could see that change shifting where. Pitchers are not getting the wins. They're not because, you know, the relievers were becoming more pivotal. Um, but, yeah, I agree with both of your picks. I mean, Felix Hernandez with, like, 2,500 strikeouts. And, I mean, it's just remarkable. And Tommy John just being able to uh, just carry on for so long and be able to be a prolific uh, pitcher over that time period. I thought they were great first two choices. Um, so, Now we're going to go on to the catchers, which, I mean, if you listen to the latest episode, I'm sure we can sort of see where this is going to go. But um, who, so who went first? Uh, Oh, so Jake went first. So Dom, you're going to go first on this round. Yeah, we can alternate and we don't need to spend as much time on each position if you have a cutoff for sure. But I do think pitcher is interesting, especially with all the injuries that we've been seeing recently in today's game, which is why Tommy John was my tie in for that. I don't personally think there's a catcher outside the Hall of Fame that is 100% worthy in my eyes uh, for statistics, but we talked about it on the show. There's a candidate that's coming up on the ballot that is extremely comparable to this player, Thurman Munson, who I still don't have his rookie card yet because I wasn't considering him a Hall of Fame candidate until recently, but Thurman Munson is a guy who won a rookie of the year, won an MVP, and was a 116 OPS plus for his career. So this is a guy that was 16% better than the average hitter during the seventies and was a true star in a limited career was able to acquire about 48 war, which for a catcher is actually a heck of a decent amount. Uh, So Thurman Munson was my choice for catcher outside the hall of fame. Cause I do think he is the most likely 
uh, non-active BBWA candidate to get the call next. So Thurman Munson, a uh, Yankees legend, unfortunately died in a plane crash. I think he would have been able to compile some better statistics uh, down the line. Uh, but this is a guy that hit 292 for his career uh, and slugged over uh, 400. So a, a really nice career, seven-time All-Star, two World Series, even won three gold gloves. So a good all-around catcher, the Yankee captain. Like he has a lot of uh, buzzwords and is talked about like a Hall of Famer already. So that's why I went with Munson. A solid pick. I mean, uh, Jake, what about you? Well, for all the Yankees and Munson fans in the chat, they're not going to like what I have to say. But if you've watched Cracking Cooperstown, you knew that already. Um, as of right now, there is only one catcher that I would vote for for the Hall of Fame if I had a vote. That is currently not Thurman Munson. Now, if you've watched the catcher episode or you haven't, you can go back and listen to it more in depth. But I think the coming two catchers uh, on the ballot will change drastically the landscape for what makes a Hall of Fame catcher. And if they do in a positive way, then I could be more swayed to vote for Munson. But today, if I could only pick one and no one else has gotten in, this is the only card I have of them. It's Yadier Molina. And that's just a base top scrum. That's all I've got. Uh, but the reason I would vote for Molina uh, is because he has over seven gold gloves, which is a secondary caller from fire for me. He has nine and he also was a 10 times all-star, which is a secondary qualifier. But in addition to that, uh, Dom will like this. He does break the rule of 2,000 hits, uh, even as a catcher. That's he huge. does break that. And he has over 1,000 RBIs as a catcher. Uh, I know you like both of those, Dom. But in addition to that, uh, a lot of times what makes a Hall of Fame resume, especially if you may consider them borderline or at a tough position by, like catcher, is what's the narrative? And the narrative very much for Molina is that he has – the credentials and uh, kind of the reputation for being the defensive wizard at his position of an entire generation. And I think that's going to go a long way, especially with the older school voters as we've come a long way with defensive statistics and even with catchers specifically with, with framing and, you know, things beyond just, you know, uh, the percentage of runners that they throw out, stuff like that. But I think Molina, uh, if there is going to be a, a defensive component to a catcher that really pushes him over the top, it, it's him. Um, so he's the only catcher, not just the catcher I chose. He's the only catcher I would choose right now that should be in the Hall of Fame that isn't. Who do you – I mean, it's it seems like the narrative is that Molina is going to get in, given today's uh, climate with the um, Hall of Fame, but with the voters, with the writers. Um, do you, I, it, it seemed, would you agree? It seems likely that Molina is going to get in before Munson gets in. Yes, probably. Uh, I, I think Dom and I would also agree that there's a better chance now that Posey gets in. And if Posey gets in, you guys I, think about I, I would be swayed yeah. to Munson. Uh, I think they're very similar. Yeah. I would take Munson before I'd take Posey. Yeah, I didn't uh, pull any Molina or guys that haven't hit the ballot yet, but I totally agree. He's someone that is deserving. And I think like we talked about with Tommy John's career looking better as the, the pitcher position evolves, as the catcher position continues to evolve with these shorter careers, a guy who caught as many games as Molina, as many staffs, and posted for as long as he did at a demanding position like that, it's going to be few and far between. Uh, he might be like the last old school catcher playing for one team like Munson did also helps. So he'll, he'll be a slam dunk, I think. So what do you think has, I mean, cause when you look at, I mean, when you, I mean, when you look at Munson's resume, I mean, it's just, you know, 294 hitter. I mean, I know he had a short, he had a short career obviously because of the, of the plane crash, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, what I, I'm, I'm trying to make sense is why it's taken so long for him to even be considered. Um, I mean, are we really just are we really waiting for Buster Posey to get in to kind of unlock that door for him? Yeah, because like like Jake said, I wouldn't have voted for Munson previously. I wasn't uh, prospecting him as a future Hall of Famer because I thought his career was a little too short. 
But if they are respecting the high peak at this catcher position now, like they showed with Maurer and are likely going to show with Posey, I think Munson deserves to get in uh, in the esque of these different peak candidates that we've seen over the years, whether it be like Dizzy Deans with pitchers or a Buster Posey catcher, like that's Munson can fit that role in the Hall of Fame, but he didn't have a traditional case because uh, of the plane crash shorting his career. And in terms of like Yadier Molina, I mean, yeah, like, like you were mentioning the narrative and just, you know, his championships with the Cardinals and his defensive prowess and um, just also being kind of a, in a, in a way, kind of a larger than life character in the game. I mean, he's, he kind of wears his heart on his sleeve. I, the one, the memory that I have, I don't know, I'm sure you guys remember this, um, Brandon Phillips mentioned in the paper uh, to the, uh, I don't know if it was a journalist, but he mentioned how he can't stand playing against the Cardinals. He can't, you know, he can't stand him. And then the very next day he goes up to bat and um, he was, I'm sure you guys remember, he was known to take his bat and kind of like hit against the, the, <laughs> the knee pads or the, um, of the catcher. And Molina mm-hmm. did, was like, no, nope, you're not doing that. And, they got, and literally the brawl, the, that brawl that took place. And I just remember Chris Carpenter being pushed all the way back into the netting and how crazy of a brawl that was. Mm. But uh, do you guys remember that video? Yeah. I do, yes. Yeah, that was, that was all over Sports Center when that happened. Oh, yeah. such It was classic, classic, classic. But good, yeah, I mean, obviously solid picks. And um, I have no – I guess the – I think you guys mentioned this, but is Molina a first ballot? Probably. I think so. Just given the again, given the uh, the climate of today's writers, they look at yeah. they look at they look at all they look at everything. Um, like, and I don't want to get too hung up into the catchers. We have uh, seven more positions to fill. But what is it about the catcher's position today that writers look at differently versus 40, 50, 60 years ago? What's the difference? I think there are definitely less workhorse catchers uh, that that stands out more um than it traditionally has like i think it was uh Mm -hmm. peeps that mentions it there in the chat he mentioned salvador perez um he may actually may actually be the last workhorse catcher um that guy's caught a lot of innings for a lot of years already for one team um Mm -hmm. and he puts he's put up pretty good offensive numbers to go along with it um some decent accolades you know he had the big what was it did he have the 40 home run season i think it was 40 um he he's got a decent start um, because so many teams, uh, even teams with good catchers, they platoon that position. I mean, yeah. you just don't see the same guy day in and day out. In some ways, it's it's similar to starting pitcher. I mean, the, the climate has just changed so drastically that the use of the bullpen for starting pitchers, you know, has limited their opportunities for wins. They're not throwing as many innings. They're not getting as many strikeouts. It just it's changed. And same for a catcher. Like, you're not going to catch every day. Um, you, you're going to split at best, you know, maybe a, a 60, 40, um, or you look at a team like, I mean, I'm biased, but you look at a team like the Braves when Travis Darno and Sean Murphy are healthy, those are two dang good catchers and neither one of them are getting their full time at the catcher position. Um, especially with the DH now available to get your catchers bat in the lineup. Now, if they're a great hitter, you know, give them a rest on the knees, slot them into DH. Um, I just think the the environment for what is an opportunity for a catcher to make a Hall of Fame case has changed. Yeah, and as the league just turns more sabermetric, especially in the Hall of Fame voting, uh, catcher is a position that's hard to accumulate a significant amount of war. I talk about 60 being a number I look for. There's very few catchers with over 60 career war. Uh, so I, I definitely think that that's part of the problem too, is if you're not a full-time player, uh, it's hard to accumulate even the sabermetric numbers. Uh, so it, they're going to be looking at peak things, uh, whether it's offensively, defensively, or in the best case, a combination of the two uh, for the future of the catcher position. But go check out our episode if you want uh, a deeper yeah. dive into yeah. the Hall of Fame catcher over on Jake's channel, Legends <laughs> Never Die. It's good a point, good, good episode. <laughs> good <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to first base. Um, Jake, you can start us off. All right, Dom, I don't know who you went with. We don't know who anybody – we didn't do it ahead of time to know who each other picks, but I think this is where we're going to get interesting. Um, 
I okay. chose, uh, I've got a, a 2021 five-star autograph of Carlos Delgado. I thought that's where you were going. I figured, well, we talk a lot. You may have been able to guess mine, but so Carlos Delgado, let's, let's talk about him for a minute. Uh, I really believe that he is a forgotten slugger of that era. Uh, I really believe that um, he has over 400 plus home runs, uh, which is a secondary qualifier for me. He actually has 473. Um, if he got those 27 more, I don't like to play the if game, but if he he did get the 27 more, we wouldn't even be talking about it. He'd be in as a 500 home run club member. He's very close. Um, but secondary qualifier to go along with over 1,500 plus RBIs. He had 1,512. That's what makes him a Hall of Famer to me. Uh, and for Dom, I know he loves this. He does break the rule of 2,000 hits. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about with the rule of 2,000 hits, uh, there's only been one exception to that. Uh, where a Hall of Famer has gotten in as a player, primarily a player, they got in that they didn't at least reach 2,000 hits. Um, so that's a significant milestone in the mind of a lot of actual voters. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a key thing. Uh, and he was a slugger, as far as we know, clean in a steroid-heavy era. So I, I believe Carlos Delgado should be a Hall of Famer. I actually think it's a shame that he fell off the ballot as fast as he did. Uh, and I, I hope he gets a, a second look uh, on his respective air committee. Didn't you guys mention, or somebody mentioned, that is he the only player that had 10 straight seasons of 30-plus home runs? Or I don't maybe that's not true. I, I'm looking at his stats now, and he had 10 straight seasons with 30 or more home runs in a row. Yeah, Pujols did that to open up his career. I know okay. that, but... Um... There definitely are a ton of guys that have been able to do that. And I think Carlos Delgado is basically Fred McGriff, the crime dog light. Uh, he's kind of this really feared hitter that because he did his damage in a juiced ball era, juiced guy era, uh, he gets a little overlooked. But I do think that a veterans committee is going to pick up that miss uh, sometime in the future. I like Carlos Delgado. When I agree, Dom, you know, Delgado not being in, it's a crime, dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's funny that you named the rule of 2,000 hits because Tommy John didn't have 2,000 hits, Thurman Munson didn't have 2,000 hits, and my first base pick is short of 2,000 hits as well, but he's been so dang close, and that is Dick Allen. Oh, oh, here we Dick go. Allen. So Dick Allen has an MVP and a Rookie of the Year as well. I think those awards do matter. Uh, there are a lot of guys that win one of those awards but do nothing for the rest of their career. He has 351 career home runs. And the scariest thing about Dick Allen is before he got blackballed out of the game, he had an 156 career OPS plus. So he was 56% better than the average hitter in the mid 60s through the 70s while he was playing. That is absolutely unbelievable. And he is the first player ever to fall one vote shy of an error committee ballot election twice. He did it the last two times he was on the ballot. He fell short. And the only thing that changed between those two votes was that he passed away and the vote got delayed and Tony Oliva and Jim Cott got ushered into the Hall of Fame. So Ricky Allen, his rookie card and everything is priced like he's already a Hall of Famer. He should be a Hall of Famer. He's the best first baseman outside the Hall of Fame. I saw a lot of Keith Hernandez and Steve Garvey love in the chat. They're deserving as well, but Dick Allen needs to get his justice first. So yeah. as – as the almighty slugger, Dick Allen, how many more RBIs mm -hmm. does he have than Yadier Molina, catcher? A, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> not even a hundred. You, he didn't play as long as Yadi, like not even close to as long. So, uh, sorry, uh, Sammy, we got to go on a, a sidebar here because it's the first time me and Dom really disagree. Okay. <laughs> I'm, this is a, a way to air it all out. <laughs> apologies mm -hmm. to Rafe from Philly, but not really. Uh, I'm not a Dick Allen for the Hall of Fame guy. I'm just not. Uh, now, you've got to be a Pete guy. You've got to be a Pete case for him if you want him in. Because I talk about my, my qualifiers all the time. There's an automatic mm -hmm. threshold, but there's also a secondary level, right? So opportunity for guys to like compile at a lower threshold in order to get into the hall of fame in, in a few categories. Right. 
Dick Allen's numbers are so low, he's not even on my spreadsheet because he doesn't reach a single one of them. Like, he doesn't crack 400 home runs. He doesn't crack 1,500 runs or 1,500 RBIs or 2,500 hits. Like, he's below 2,000, like Dom said. He barely cracks 1,000 runs and RBIs. Like, I, putting him up against other guys at his position, I just don't think he's close. I think he's so far down the list. Now, if the hardware matters more, then you're in Dom's camp. Um, but I think that someone could play two seasons or three and happen to get that hardware. And what if they retired the day after Are they a hall of famer? I say no, but the case is built on that hardware. Mostly, yeah. not all, but mostly. Yeah. And just to talk about Dick Allen's MVP very briefly, he led the league with a 420 on base percentage. 37 home runs, 113 RBIs. He batted 308 and didn't win the batting title, slugged 603 and had a 199 OPS plus. He earned that hardware. Like that's that's twice as good as the average hitter during the 1972 season. Uh, and he had some injuries. He got blackballed by the media. There's a lot of reasons why Dick Allen hasn't gotten the support for the Hall of Fame. But like you said, the Rule 2000 matters with the BBWAA. These era committees have elected Tony Oliva and other guys recently that don't have 2,000 hits that had the peak, and Dick Allen fits that bill. Do you think that Do you think that Cody Bellinger is a Hall of Famer if he retires right now? No. He won an MVP. His statistics, he- statistics as a slucker were probably similar. He's got. He's gonna end his career with fifty-eight point seven career WAR and over a thousand runs and RBIs. I don't think no. so. <laughs> but I think if the main the main argument is look how dominant he was for one year. No, but that's what I'm saying. Like sixty is a good milestone for me. Like if you have sixty in a twenty-six year career, that's good. And he's fifty-eight point seven in basically fourteen seasons, even though he played in fifteen. Okay, so you're you're saying largely his case is sabermetric on peak for WAR. Yeah, like he's, what's, he's what's a, his jaws? He's, Do you know? Yeah, he's a he's a peak just he's a peak case for sure. But he's someone that during his time was one of the best hitters in baseball, and he doesn't get treated that way. Okay, well, for our boy Jared, because we're going to this position in a minute, and I don't think you picked him, and I know he mentioned him. So, if you're yes on Dick Allen, are you a yes on Dale Murphy? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm a no on Dale Murphy, but at least, you know, that's, I'd be happy with both of them. Cause he's, he'd be, he'd be peak. Now his career numbers Mm -hmm. are better than Allen's, but yeah, he, he, he compiled a little more than Allen did, but he didn't have the, uh, the peak that Allen did either. All right. All right. Well, what would it be uh, a cracking Cooperstown light episode if we didn't argue one time? (laughs) (laughs) I was kind of like, as you guys were talking, I literally just, juggling tabs on my uh, Google Chrome, just uh, seeing what like Delgado's stats are, Dick Allen's stats, Garvey stats, Hernandez stats, Del Murphy stats. And then I even went to Cody Bellinger and I was looking at his war and it's just a 22 and, you know, pretty, uh, this, and so far this year, it's a negative point. Whatever. I can't, I can't. Oh, we're a week into the season. That's not fair. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. um I can see why everyone is very much in love with Steve Garvey. I mean, I'm looking at his numbers, 294 batting average, 1,300 RBIs, 270, 272 home runs, twenty about pretty much 2,600 hits. But his mm-hmm. war is very low. It's a 38. So um, I can see why you guys did not want to go that direction with him. Um, but, I mean, what is the most important – to you, I'm not. I, I don't really go into the sabermetrics very well, very much. So, what is the most? What would you say if you had to give two or three saber uh, sabermetric stats that are important to your decisions? What are they? I think that I I think it would probably come down to uh, batting war, defensive war, and OPS plus. Those are probably the three that I look at the most. Uh, OPS plus is the on-base plus slugging, and that is not only compared to the league average, but it is ballpark adjusted. So if you're playing in Coors Field or Yankee Stadium, which is an absolute bound, a band box, you actually get dinged for that in OPS plus. If you're playing in a pitcher's ballpark where you have to really crush it to hit a home run, you actually get a little boost in OPS plus. 
So those are the three categories I kind of look in. And like I said, favorite metrics, I think that they, in some parts of the game are overused and some parts are underutilized, but I do think they help tell part of the story for like a Dick Allen who didn't play 20 years to compile 2,500 hits like Steve Garvey did, but his rate stats show how great of a hitter he truly was during his time. So that, that's where I kind of be able to fill the gaps with sabermetrics. And Jake, what do you look for in terms of uh, like an, analyzing a player? Well, I think part of that's been obvious based on what I've been saying. Um, I care a lot more about milestones. I do. Um, I think longevity is valuable. Um, compiler is not a bad word to me. Uh, I think there are exceptions to that rule uh, in terms of hardware and peak. Uh, my threshold is a little higher than Dom's. That's okay. Um, but that's the way I look at it. Um, as far as do I look at Saber metrics? Do I care about them at all? Yes, but they're much further down the list for me. Um, it's almost like a, uh, a borderline type thing for me. It, it can put them over the bump um, if I think they're close otherwise. Um, the two things I look at the most, um, I don't value it a lot, but I do look at war. I care more, though, about Jaws. Um, uh, recommendation uh, for everybody out there. Um, if you haven't read Jay Jaffe's book, ironically, the same name as our podcast, Cracking Cooper's Town. Uh, I love that book. I don't disagree with him always on his opinions on Hall of Famers and why. Yeah but it's an excellent in-depth look by position of guys that should be in shouldn't uh, cause the additional tagline to his title is pack your plaques. Uh, you know, guys that he doesn't believe should be in the hall that are and why. Uh, but jaws is a metric that he created. It is in essence uh, the seven best years of a player's career to create a peak war number for them. Um, mm -hmm. So were they that elite you know, peak type player. Um, if I look at any uh, saber metric, that's one that I pay a little more attention to. In addition to, I do like OPS plus for the reasons that Dom already mentioned. Yeah, I left I left Jaws for you because I know that's the one saber metric tool you actually use. Uh, but I think yeah, whether whether you whether you use Jaws or War Seven, uh, which is the baseball reference thing, uh, you can kind of see for the players that didn't have like the compiling and just get like a case for like where their peak lands in the history of the game uh, but just for uh clarification jay jaffe we didn't steal the name of your book uh, he's the cooperstown case book oh it, that's right jay Jaffe's book. we came up with our name ourselves uh i just wanted to clarify that so there's no uh, <laughs> impending lawsuits in the mail uh but yeah we're good we're good there thanks dom i knew i was messing that up i was like wait that doesn't sound right <laughs> <laughs> and I saw uh, just just to just to keep this rolling. I saw six six one fish. I believe uh, oh. talked about my second baseman of choice, Mister Sweet Lou Whitaker. <laughs> so right, we're gonna go right right into it. I, I'm I'm just rolling. Yeah, go so ahead, Sweet man. Lou Whitaker. Uh, if, like I said, he compiled but seventy five point one career WAR. It's top ten all time for a second baseman. He breaks the rule of two thousand. I first candidate to do so twenty three sixty nine. As a second baseman, 244 home runs and a 276 batting average. He scored over 1,300 runs and drove in over 1,000 runs. And his OPS plus for his career was a buck 17. He won a rookie of the year, the five time All Star, four time Silver Slugger, three time Gold Glover. It amazed me when Alan Trammell, his double play combo buddy, got in the Hall of Fame and they didn't put them in together because Lou Whitaker actually ranks higher as a second baseman than Alan Trammell does as a shortstop. And they're both very similar cases as like mid-level Hall of Fame middle infielders. So I'm a big advocate for Lou Whitaker to get into the Hall of Fame. He stopped signing TTM because he knows he's going to be getting in soon. I expect that to happen the next time he's on an error committee. It's a good choice. I like Lou. And it's not because he's from New York City or Brooklyn, whatever, however you want to call it. Or maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's um, – yeah, I'm looking at his stats now. 75 career war, as you mentioned, 276. Uh, rookie of the year, five-time All-Star, three-time Gold Glove. He won a World Series, four-time Silver, Silver Slugger. And I do like the fact that a player that a player that plays with one team for the entire duration of their career 
it's a nice it's a nice uplift. Certainly doesn't people hurt. People love that story. People love that narrative. Um, yeah, I think yeah, Lou Whitaker. Yeah, it's just yeah, two thousand three hundred sixty nine hits. Yeah, it's on base percentage three sixty three, one hundred forty three stolen bases. Solid player, absolutely. Uh, Jake, which where are you going with this one? So this is going to be my most controversial decision of this exercise. <laughs> so Sammy said that okay. we could choose any retired player that we believe should be in the Hall of Fame per position for this exercise. Now, a couple quick things here uh, as to build off your choice of Whitaker. Uh, I obviously am big on my milestones, right? And I'm about the system, okay? I hate, hate the thought process of let's play seven degrees removed from Kevin Bacon with a Hall of Famer. And if he is seven de- within seven degrees, then we should make him a Hall of Famer because he's comparable to XYZ player. So like Trammell's in, it's travesty that Whitaker should be in or such and such second baseman should be in. Uh, so Whitaker should, okay? Well, if you also believe that the Hall of Fame has made mistakes in putting players already in, you can't have both, okay? So we can only get better by putting in who should be Hall of Fame worthy. We can't take people out. We can't kick them out. So using the whole, well, such and such is in, so I want my player to be in, also then can apply, well, you can't get in because that guy's in and he sucks. Like, that's a bad comp. It doesn't work that way. In my opinion, it shouldn't. Therefore, my controversial decision, I've done this on four collectors before, but my decision at second base of who I think should be in that's currently retired, nobody. No retired second baseman, in my opinion, should be in the Hall of Fame that isn't. Now, <laughs> To fill this with an additional thought, because I wouldn't vote for Whitaker. I wouldn't vote for Gritch. I wouldn't vote for Jeff Kent. The list goes on. Oh, man. The player that I believe is the next Hall of Fame second baseman is playing today. Altuve. Jose Altuve. Okay. He is less than 500 hits from 2,500, which would be a secondary qualifier for me already. He's less than 500 runs from 1,500 another secondary qualifier. The man already is an eight-time All-Star. If he gets two more, that's another qualifier. And the man already has three batting titles. Okay. Now, I know I cheated and I bended the rules a little, but that's what I think about the position of second base. I, I, lo- I love the comment, Mike. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is why it's good when we record – like not live so i can cut this kind of stuff out and like talk him through it and be like hey like dick let's 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 do it this way or you have to pick somebody for the sake of the episode um i hate to break it to you jose altuve sent a five-year extension and then he has to wait five years they're one of those guys that you just named at least if not multiple of those second basemen are going to get in the hall of fame before jose altuve so he will not be the next second baseman to get into the hall of fame oh i feel sorry coming on like Jeff Kent has the most home runs by a second baseman. Jose Altuve is not going to beat him there. And I don't think Jose Altuve is going to finish his career with 75 career war or better. So those, those, I'm not saying that either one of those players is better than Jose Altuve as a whole. I think Jose Altuve is on a hall of fame path. We've talked about that before. Uh, but Lou Whitaker, man, like I said, like I said, 60 gets me interested <laughs> as a war and to have 75 in 19 seasons, which is basically 18, like uh-huh. under two decades to be able to do that, like that's very impressive and it's amazing. I don't think, I think you're right when you're saying the comparison thing, but I don't think Alan Trammell was one of those mistakes by the baseball writers. Like I think he's a mid tier hall of fame shortstop. And my argument is that Lou Whitaker who played next to him for the same amount of years is a mid tier second baseman. That's actually higher on the second base tier list than Alan Trammell. So that's what I was trying to get across not saying, oh, Alan Trammell's in, so his double play partner has to be in. His double play partner's deserving, too. And it was weird that they picked one over the other because I would have picked Whitaker, honestly. What I think it's it's clear is you've discovered, Sammy, you probably already know, you listen to the podcast all the time. <laughs> Dom <laughs> is very much a big haul guy, and so are most of the people in the chat, right? 
I'm a small hall. I have small hall tendencies. Okay. I, I think the mostly the best of the best should be in the hall, not just the Hank Aaron's and the Babe Ruth's, but my thresholds are higher. That is clear. Um, what I don't like also is people that are like, you're crazy. Lou Whitaker should be in, you know, Bobby Grit should be in. They're the same people that complain when another borderline candidate gets in. Um, you can't have both. Uh, pick a system and stick to it. Um, that's why Dom and I can have these conversations and go back and forth because <laughs> I'd like to think we're both pretty consistent. Yeah, right about absolutely. It. And I think by most people's measures, Whitaker isn't borderline. I think he, I think he's above the threshold. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> he made it let to this area committee awful let easily. Let me ask you guys a question: If Robbie Cano didn't didn't uh, get caught with steroids, didn't have the whole scandal, is he a Hall of Famer? He was on pace. He could have got there. Do you think it makes a difference that he was a Yankee? No, I I think that I I think that playing in the same market can help you, uh, but I don't think that there's too much uh, of that cronyism anymore about like, hey, like he played for the Giants of this day or the Cardinals or the Yankees. Uh, so I don't think the Yankees thing really would have helped or hurt him too much. It was more so the steroid thing because we'll get to that in a little bit. But if you get suspended for steroids after they've been outlawed, I think that you're off my board completely uh, for Hall of Fame consideration. Cano had over 2,500 hits, really actually over 2,600 uh, that's the only qualifier that he hits for me. However, I agree with Dom that he was on pace. He was only a couple hundred um, runs away. I think it was runs, may have been RBIs, uh, from 1,500. Um, you know, had he not lost the time that he did to steroids, in theory, if he was the same caliber of player, then I think he was on a Hall of Fame pace. Um, but I don't think he will be one. Interesting. I'm just taking a look at something here. Um, I think if there's a Hall of Fame second baseman that's deserving to be in for getting absolutely crushed in a in a routine in a routine play, Fernando Vigne gets my vote. <laughs> uh, someone mentioned Albert Bell earlier in this chat. You know, Sammy, I like your pick better than Jake's pick because Jake picked nobody and you at least picked somebody. So I appreciate the gusto. I actually love the fact that Jake picked nobody because everybody in the chat went haywire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, just, man, nobody meets the thresholds. Listen, uh, uh, that's that's the beauty of this is that you guys have your you guys have the your cutoffs in terms of what mm -hmm. you expect. Like if you were writers, this is you know this is what you guys are uh, voting for. So everyone has their has a right to their opinion. So as ludicrous as it may be. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I can big, take it, man. I wouldn't have said it if I couldn't take it. I'm a big fan of it. I'm a big fan of that because I don't think anybody was expecting you to say nobody, which is great. <laughs> uh, but it's such a, yeah, second base is such a tough position. I mean, it's, I, I like Jeff Kent. I mean, Jeff mm -hmm. Kent, the, was he, he's the, the, has hit the most home runs for as a second baseman. Mm -hmm. Yep, most Someone home who hit like 1,500 RBIs and uh, what, almost 400 home runs. Um, only problem with him is, I mean, he has an MVP, but that's really the, I mean, the extent of it. I'm looking at the stats now. I mean, he's a silver slugger and an, and an all-star. He has the modern problem of jerkitis. Uh, there's not yeah. a lot of writers that like the man, and that definitely has hurt his chances of getting support. Yeah, that's yeah, that's un, that's unfortunate because I'm sure. I mean, there's a lot of guys in the hall that probably were not well respected or liked, and that are in there. So, agreed. I, I I view Jeff Kent similar to how I view Todd Helton in terms of their case statistically to how close they are to a, a line of being a Hall of Famer. I'm not upset that Helton got in. He is extremely close by my metrics. Um, and he's a Hall of Famer, and I, I respect that, and that, that's good. Um, Kent, very, very close by my metrics of being a Hall of Famer. Would I be upset he got in if he did? No. Uh, he's only 23 homers away from 400 homers, uh, most as a second baseman. 
Uh, he's only 39 hits away from 2,500. And he also does have over 1,500 RBI with 1,525. And his 1,320 uh, runs also is not far off from 1,500. Heck, most right. of those numbers sound better than Dick Allen. Wow. <laughs> hey, shot. different different eras, man. But I agree, Jeff Kent should be in the Hall of Fame too. All right, guys, let's move on to shortstop. Uh, this should oh, be a fun one. If we're if we're going in the order of positions, we oh, got go no, third, third, third base. Third base. Third base. My mistake. I'm jumping ahead. Third <laughs> I love base. Mike's comment. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike, Mike Altuve towers over Jake. Oh, come on. The show. He towers over him. <laughs> but who's your third baseman, my guy? I did pick somebody. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's a progress. We'll take progress. I pick somebody. Now, this is my exception to I said I wasn't going to pick any of the slam dunk guys that people always talk about, but. This is a 1973 tops of, of Pete Rose, and I did bend the rules a little. I put him at third base. Um, oh God! And I'm I'm not gonna. It even says outfield on the card. That's funny. Um, but Rose, he's all time hit king. He meets many of the metrics. I'm not gonna beat it into the ground, but I do believe that Pete Rose should be a Hall of Famer. I'm in that camp. Uh, it's kind of funny that I get to go right after my second base uh, controversy. Maybe that will win me some some love. Most people are pro Pete Rose, so it will get you some love. But I, I just want to let everybody at home and and both of you know, Pete Rose has never been and will never be eligible for the Hall of Fame. So statistically, absolutely, but just there, there's zero shot that he gets into the Hall of Fame. Never say never, Dom. Be an optimist, Mister Big oh. Hall. Hey, I'm just saying the 1919 Black Sox that got banned from baseball have been dead for a long time. And everyone's saying, oh, when Pete Rose dies, then they're going to put him in. I just, I think when you're banned from baseball, you're banned from baseball. This sport is very old school like that. Time will tell. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I love Pete Rose. I mean, the guy loves baseball. I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that count towards something? I mean, he's all over the sport. He, he talks, he, I mean, uh, it's such a shame. But, all right, um, who's your pick, Don? My pick is dead and has been passed over by the Hall of Fame. Uh, I think that Ken Boyer is by far the greatest uh, third baseman outside the Hall of Fame. Uh, this is his 1955 Topps rookie card. I think that's just a beautiful card, too, the green and yellow. Uh, Ken Boyer... Again, like I said, 60 war gets me interested, and he has, I believe, 62.8 war for his career. Uh, guy who had some decent power, 282 career home runs, drove in over 1,100 runs and scored over 1,100 runs, a career 287 hitter. He broke the rule 2,000 with 2,143 hits. He won an MVP in 1964, was an 11-time All-Star, a five-time Gold Glove winner, and to just add some gusto, in 1964, his MVP season, he hit the biggest home run of his life against the Yankees in the World Series, a grand slam that ended up icing the game. Uh, so Ken Boyer is one of those all-around great third basemen. And I think, like we talked about, modern cases impacting future decisions. I think Scott Rowland's election was the first turning stone for Ken Boyer's eventual election and possibly the elections of guys like Greg Nettles and Buddy Bell down the line, who are similar cases to Boyer, but just a little bit more uh, flawed. So I think Ken Boyer is the best third baseman outside the Hall of Fame, and I'll take him all day. I think I remember here. I was listening to you guys this morning. I can't remember which episode it was, but you mentioned Ken Boyer. <clears throat> so that was um, – I'm looking at his stats. MVP, 64, won the World Series of 64. Um Player of the Year, 11-time All-Star, 5-time Gold Glove, 287 lifetime, 282 home runs, one over 1,100 runs, knocked mm -hmm. at 11. Yeah, so his numbers, yeah, I'm looking at consistently. I mean, towards the end of his career, obviously, he kind of just fizzled out. But um, prior to that, I mean, consistent, very consistent, even from his first year. So... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people seem to agree with you, so that's uh, it's a good pick. 
So yeah, I think if he didn't pass away early, he might have gotten some love on a veterans committee for him to get his moment. He died in 1982. I believe so. He's been long deceased, and with the current setup of the era committee, it might be a challenge for him to get in. Uh, but when you start looking at like the well-rounded third base candidates, like Scott Rowland was as a, a two-way threat, uh, Ken Boyer I think is at the top of the list with guys like Greg Nettles and Buddy Bell as well, fitting that similar type of archetype. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, nettles, nettles is the same thing, like more strikeouts and power, uh, but not quite the same uh, accumulation that Boyer had. So I would put him kind of like a peg or two below Boyer, but deserving still in my book. Why? So going back to Pete Rose, why is the gambling thing so like so uh, they're just they're they're so um, I can't remember what kind of phrase it right. They're just staunchly against the whole concept of it, and they just can't let it go. Yeah, baseball had one they rule had that, that was not gray, one black and white rule, and Pete Rose knew it for many years. The Black Sox story has been told for decades before. Uh, it was in all the locker rooms. It was in all his contracts. It was in everything, uh, and he broke it. So that's kind of the end of that story for me. Is it a shame that the all-time hit king doesn't have a plaque in Cooperstown? Absolutely. But based off the history of the Hall of Fame and how they've handled that issue, I don't think that's going to happen. His memorabilia is still there. He's still a great uh, voice and advocate for the game. Uh, and he serves as kind of a living uh, lesson for people that weren't uh, alive when the Black Sox scandal happened. They see Pete Rose as that new example. So that's kind of where he sits for now. Well, yeah, I overheard somebody today at the show I was setting up, I set up at, and this guy said that uh, Pete Rose will not get in until after he's dead. Even he, after that, I don't think so. <laughs> when he, Heaven forbid that we see a progression in steroids players being allowed in, not that I'm pro or against it, whatever, but if we do see a progression, like if we go past – the Bonds, the Sheffields, the Clemens, where maybe it was still gray what the rule was, you know, baseball turn a blind eye and they get in. But if we progress past that to an era of like, let's say Fernando Tatis, right? Let's say that he has a Hall of Fame career and he got popped for steroids in like year two, but he gets in, you know, we're talking 40 years down the road, whatever. But if he gets in, now it's clear that it was a black and white rule. It was broken and we put him in the hall anyways. Okay. Well, now, I, what about Rose? He, he yeah, I think black and white rule. Granted, yeah. we're a long stretch down the highway from that, but I'm just saying, are we going to progress to that? And if we do, that's one less leg to stand on. Yeah, I think the writers could progress to that point, and not to like drag this out, uh, but I do think that when you get caught for steroids, it's a 80 game ban, I believe, currently for the first time offense as opposed to being banned. So there, there, there are different levels of punishment there uh, in terms of that being an issue in the game and how it's handled. Like, like Fernando Tatis has returned to play. Pete Rose hasn't returned to baseball since his issue. So I, I don't know if that'll be enough uh, to get that longstanding uh, bias and uh, rule uplifted, but I, I guess we'll see if that has any effect on it down the road. I don't think the guys that got suspended for steroids are going to get much support. Fernando Tatis, if he has 3,000 hits and 700 home runs like A-Rod, he'll get like 35, 40% of the vote on the writer's ballot. So We'll see. And I, that would not to get us on a complete sidebar. I'll shut up after this. But like, does that beg the question that the steroids punishment should be steeper than what it is? is you can it, make the argument. Does Does the punishment match the crime? Um, and how serious baseball takes it now, I I don't know if that's true. Um, but that would be another podcast, right, Sammy? <laughs> I think so. Um, we'll move on now to the shortstop position. Yeah, shortstop was incredibly tough for me because I do think that there is some questionable shortstop elections already in the Hall of Fame for like these borderline non-slam dunk guys. Uh, and it is a tough position to play both ways. Uh, so the guy that I ended up going with isn't someone that I personally advocate for, but if he got into the Hall of Fame, I wouldn't 
uh, raise up a storm. I would I would combat it, but not uh, completely illegitimize it. And that's Davy Concepcion. So he was the shortstop for the Big Red Machine in the 1970s, uh, and he was a nine-time All-Star, so just one short of my milestone of 10. He had 993 career runs, so seven short of 1,000, 950 RBIs, so just short of 1,000, over 2,000 hits, 23, 26, uh, 321 stolen bases, which matters for me. He was a well-rounded player in that right. Five-time gold glove, so he was a very good defensive shortstop, two World Series, two Silver Sluggers. And during one of his nine All-Star appearances, he won a uh, All-Star MVP, so... I don't think that there's a glaring shortstop outside the Hall of Fame uh, that is deserving, but unlike Jake, I picked one that uh, I wouldn't completely hate if they got elected. So I went with Dave Concepcion. I don't feel great about it, but uh, I had to fill out the lineup. Just just say it, Dom. You weren't willing to wear that heat like I was, okay? No, I didn't know that was an I didn't know not doing the exercise was an option. So I did the exercise, uh, and I filled out my lineup card. He said, pick a player you believed should be in the Hall of Fame that's not, that's retired. Yeah. For, I, for I, a whole, he, he wanted a whole lineup. So if, if our teams are playing each other, I just have to hit it at second base and nobody will be there to field it. And I'll just have base hits all day. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. And I'll have Dave Concepcion with his five gold glove defense at shortstop to take hits away from you. So I'm going to win this game. No doubt about it. I'm going to have a real <laughs> Hall of Fame team. You're going to have a Hall of Fame team. <laughs> Okay, well, unlike Dom, okay, I chose someone who I would actually advocate for as a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to cop out like Dom. Uh, I don't have a card, though, unfortunately, thing. Uh, but the reason I don't have a card yet of this player is they're not cheap um, because I need one for my T206 set. Okay, this is the player that I believe is the last overlooked dead ball hitter. And that is none other than Bad Bill Dolan. He has over 500 stolen bases, uh, almost mm -hmm. 600, 548. He also has over uh, 1,500 uh, mm -hmm. runs with 1,590. He was only 39 hits short of 2,500. He had 2,461. He had also uh, more RBIs than Dick Allen uh, in the dead ball era when they, you know, weren't big on scoring runs or driving in runs. One thousand two hundred and thirty-four, uh, and I think it's amazing that there are still players that actually have a decent case, even if he doesn't get in, that actually have a decent case of being a Hall of Famer that have been done playing for a hundred plus years. Um, mm -hmm. That's incredible. Uh, that speaks to the rich history of the game and and really we go back and forth and we like to tease each other and, and debate these things, but it's really what makes baseball such an interesting game, uh, especially in terms of its hall of fame. It's like no other. No, I agree. And I think Bill Don is deserving. Uh, uh, another part of this exercise was we were supposed to try to have cards of the guy. So I didn't go pre-war Bill Dolan. I could uh, not pick I, him, but I had to pick him. No, I, I hear you. I think that he is definitely overlooked, uh, and there are actually a few other dead ball hitters uh, that I actually think are kind of interesting and deserving too, 100-plus years later. Uh, but that can be another episode, like you said. Uh, Bill Dolan, I think just with the way the error committees are set up right now, when he's on the same ballot as guys like Dick Allen from the Golden Age and all the uh, – unrealized uh, Negro League stories and stuff from that era as well. It's really hard for him to garner support. I think the last time he was on the ballot, he had three or less votes. Uh, but a guy that just pure resume is deserving. And he's he's gotten a big push from the Sabre community in recent years, uh, which does matter um, mm -hmm. in terms of raising support for a candidate, especially with those era committees. Um, Sabre, I'm not going to say they you know influence the ballot box, if you will. Uh, but they do an awesome job creating awareness and and getting the powers that be that do have votes uh, to actually re-examine uh, these resumes, if you will, uh, through a different lens and for a second time. Mookie believes that Ray Ardonez should be in. <laughs> he goes, is that good? Borderline, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's, what's his, what, what was his peak? 
<laughs> oh man, do we want to? I mean, I have his stats here. His best, <laughs> his best year. Oh God. Um, let's see. He his best year was he batted two fifty eight, one home run, six, sixty RBIs. <laughs> oh man, great defensive shortstop, but you know that's it. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so am i up first now on outfielders yeah how do you guys want to do this i know i mean you said jake that you just picked outfielders not position not based on position okay yeah so do it do yeah, it so just on. left center right however, however you want to put them however you want to sure. put them yeah that's fine we could do left field for whatever all right so i'm gonna go first i'm gonna get this out of the way uh, you know what I'm going with, Dom. You know I got to talk about him. Oh boy, my boy Andrew Jones. That's a uh, okay. 2015 20, uh, five star autograph. There. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. I am a Braves fan. Let's get that out of the way. Uh, but he does meet my metrics. I'm all about the system. I turned Dale Murphy away, but I'm a yes on Andrew Jones. He did hit 400 plus home runs. And he does have seven or more gold gloves. He actually has 10 gold gloves. And I know that Dom knows the answer to this question because I've brought it up to him 15 times. So I'm going to ask Sammy the question. There are two other players that are not Andrew Jones that are not in the Hall of Fame that have double-digit gold gloves. Who are they? Are we talking about just outfielders or just talking about position players just- in general? Position players in general. There are two other double-digit gold glove players. I can only think of one right now, Omar Vizquel. Nope. No, Vizquel doesn't have more than nine? I think he has nine. Is that right, Dom? No, there are three. There are three. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, three. Uh, One is is an outfielder. That's why I told you the wrong number. One's an outfielder. Two are not. Um, So there are three. You got one, Vizquel. Who are the other two? I'm terrible at this, to be honest with you. You got Everyone, one. Everybody's saying, like, like, Adam is saying Hernandez. They're all saying Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez yeah. is the other one. Two. That's two of them. There's one more. I'll leave it to these guys in the chat. I'm terrible at this. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, He's a right- I'm, using, I'm using a lifeline here. <laughs> yeah, the last one's a right fielder. Right and fielder. He's, and he's a member of the 3,000 hit club. He's mm-hmm. not in the Hall of not, not yet. Has, hasn't not been yet. eligible. Recently retired. Why am I not thinking? Is it? He got yeah, all I'm... ten gold gloves his first ten years in the league. Oh, yeah, everyone's saying each row. Yeah, each row. Yeah. Each row. Yeah. Okay. So Andrew Jones is the the other player uh, that we're talking about here. Yeah. So I think that combination of the four hundred plus homers that's a true power threshold. Uh, along with the elite defense uh, in center field, makes them Hall of Famer. And the I heard the argument recently, it actually blew my mind, uh, that I heard some people that really believed that if Andrew Jones would have retired after his Braves career, that he would have been a Hall of Famer. And that had he not continued on and compiled any more numbers, he wouldn't have reached the 400 home run mark at least, uh, that he would be a Hall of Famer. So I find that interesting that his case would be punished because he continued playing for years after the fact. Now, obviously, I understand. No, he was not at the same level. He was not at the same caliber. His fall off was drastic and sudden. Um, You know, he didn't play well on into his 30s at a high level. He didn't. Um, But I find that interesting that he continued to play. And had he just not played, that people think he would be a Hall of Famer. I do like Andrew Jones as a pick. Um, the only thing to me, like I'm, I'm looking at just statistics alone, his batting average at 254 lifetime is to me is what kind of hurts his chances. His defensive abilities, head. his defensive abilities are, you know, I mean, they're among some of the some of the best in the game. I mean, 10 Gold Gloves in the outfield is remarkable. Um, stolen base 152, respectable. Uh, 434 home runs. I mean, that's yeah. Uh, to go along with the defense, I mean, that's amazing. It's just yeah, the batting average being as low, being 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 that low. I don't know. 
statistically what other career 250 batting average Hall of Famers there are off the top of my head. Um, I know what like, was a killer brew was like what like 265, 267 or something like that. Brooks was about 267. Oh no, yeah, Brooks was around there. But um, yeah, killer brew, killer brew 256. Oh, killer brew 256. Yeah. I thought it was a little higher. There's, there's a handful like, of guys between 200 and 260. Yeah, granted, he was a 500 home run club member. I I love right. Home so. But Andrew Jones, yeah, 434 wasn't that far off. I mean, he had you know, 17, 19, 13, 14 to finish his last four years. I mean, but it was it that 2008 season with the Dodgers. He only played 75 games. He batted like 158 or something. Yeah, so it killed his average. But he was already he was already dropping down. Like 2007, he's batted 222 from he went 40 points down. And, um, yeah, it was just dropping off. He's been a little all over the place, batting average-wise. 303, 251, 264, 277, 261, yeah. 263, 262. So, I mean, you can make a case. I mean, there's some people already commenting, like Ozzie Smith, 262. And, yeah, there's – Brooks was 267. Right. So, it's 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 a tough argument. But I do like Andrew Jones. I mean, I, I like I like I mean, he's again the defense and the home runs and just the contributions. Can't argue it. So I totally understand that pick. Yeah, and if you pair ten gold gloves with four hundred plus home runs, the only other guys to do that are Ken Griffey Jr., Mike Schmidt, and Willie Mays. Yeah. So elite, elite company. Uh, I didn't consider Andrew Jones, even though I do think he's Hall of Fame worthy just because he's still on the ballot. Uh, but I do think that he has a real chance to be like that first guy to break the rule of 2000 through the writers. He's on pace right now to potentially do that. All right, Dom, who's your pick for first? So, my left fielder is another controversial guy that a lot of people are pro Hall of Fame, uh, but he's actually eligible for the Hall of Fame and got a shot with the writers and an error committee. And it's one of the greatest hitters that ever lived. It's Barry Lamar Bonds. So I talked about 60 war being eye popping. He has 162.8. He got blackballed from the league. So he fell uh, about 65 hits short of 3,000, uh, four RBI short of 2,000. He has over 500 career stolen bases, a 298 career hitter, all time leader in walks a 444 on base percentage and a 607 slug for his career. Good for a 182 OPS plus. So he's 82% better than the average player in his career. Seven MVPs, eight gold gloves, two batting titles, 14 all-star appearances. Like, come on. I, I don't understand how Barry Bonds uh, is getting blackballed the way he is because he was in that gray area period. To me, if you did it when baseball outlawed it and you got suspended, you broke a written rule. But we don't know who did steroids during the steroid era, even the ones that showed a little more with the fat heads. We don't know 100% if they did or did not. And to me, Barry Bonds should not be punished any different than a Derek Jeter, Jeff Bagwell, Jim Tomey, guys from that same era that have been elected that are considered clean or, or questionably dirty. I think Barry Bonds is in that same bucket. And even if he doesn't get 100% of the vote, I, I don't know how you leave a top five player that's eligible for the Hall of Fame out of the Hall of Fame. I'm begrudgingly – I agree with you. I don't like Bonds, but I agree with you for all the reasons you stated. The, the problem is, is that he's the poster boy for steroids, alleged or not. Um, but – in, Dom and I have talked about this in depth, but if Ortiz is in, who was not proven as steroids per se, but failed a test, we know that he failed a test, even if it wasn't a black and white rule, he failed a test, he's in. But he is beloved by baseball fans everywhere. And he is also not the poster yeah. child for steroids. He's the poster child for Boston Strong, Right. And the funny guy that's now an analyst and all those things that A-Rod tries really hard to be but isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the difference between Bonds and Ortiz. But really, they should be the same. 
you know, they they broke the rules in the yeah. gray period area. Like that is different than a rod failing it, getting popped twice, you know, suspended twice, or like Manny doing the same thing. Uh, or at least I think it should be. Um, now I, I flipped to that perspective when Ortiz got in for those reasons. Um, so why why Bonds yeah. should be in? It's it's because he's the poster child, but you know. Well, they're the poster child for the negative aspect of that era because when the 98 season happened with Maguire and Sosa those guys were American heroes they could get a free right. beer in any city in the country right. uh, but when it comes to negativity Bonds and Clemens they both suffered from the same thing Jeff Kent with the jerkitis like they were not nice to writers during their playing days even though those same writers begrudgingly gave them seven Cy Youngs and seven MVPs respectively uh, and those are guys that unlike Bond, unlike Pete Rose, were uh, actually eligible for the Hall of Fame, like to be elected. So I think it's just a matter of time. I don't know what committee is going to have to come together to get Barry Bonds in, uh, but he's an eligible candidate and I couldn't leave him off my lineup. Well, and that's like, I also just a quick aside on another player and then I'll go to my next, off or you can go to your next outfielder. Um, mm -hmm. McGuire, I think it does matter or should matter that Maguire like owned up to it. Like he didn't even break a black and white rule, but like he apologized. And in, in my eyes, like I, I think that that matters like of like, Hey, baseball, I did you wrong. Like, forgive me kind of deal. And uh, I, I think Maguire should be a hall of famer um, along the same lines as Ortiz and bonds. But the difference is, is Maguire's done something to endear himself to baseball Again, the fans, the players, you know, he's been involved as a hitting coach and, and those kind of things, trying to repay the game. Um, where Bonds, yes, he was a hitting structure in Miami. He's a special advisor to San Francisco, but very much as a person, Bonds is like, screw everybody. Like, and that's that he's not helping his case. Good picks overall. Right. I mean, yeah, it's Bonds is because of how recent of you know he played he's always going to be a huge topic of discussion because of all the accolades he's collected yeah and he's, he's so fresh in our minds so it's that alone is another uh, podcast altogether of Barry yeah. Bonds legacy and, and for what it's worth Barry Bonds played three seasons in the league while they were testing for steroids and he didn't pop off positive in service suspension that doesn't mean he didn't use them at any time in his career or wasn't using them and was uh, cheating his way out of the tests. But it's something where he didn't get knocked for the actual thing once it was outlawed. And I think that's an important distinction for people to make. Uh, A-Rod and Manny Ramirez and Fernando Tatis, like guys like that that have gotten caught, that that is something that's on their resume and they've missed time and were punished for breaking a rule of baseball. Bud Selig and whether it's the guys that are questionable, uh, everyone talks about Jeff Bagwell and Mike Piazza and Ivan Rodriguez and potential steroid guys that are already in the Hall of Fame. And they talk about guys like Derek Jeter, Ken Griffey Jr. and Jim Tomey that are obviously clean. We don't know because they weren't testing and popping guys back then. So I'm not going to give anybody the benefit of the doubt or, or punish them either. Uh, so that's why I'm there with Bonds. And I saw, uh, I believe Blix Cards was commenting it when we got to the outfield. This is a very personal one of mine. Uh, but my center fielder of choice is Veda Pinson. And I know Jake doesn't love it. Uh, Veda Pinson, I talked about it. The only players in their career to get to 2,000 career hits, 200 home runs, and 200 stolen bases faster uh, were Willie Mays and Jose Altuve. He had an amazing start to his career. He was a highly touted prospect. He got 54.2 career war in his career, 2757 career hits, which is the second most outside of the Hall of Fame that doesn't have any steroid uh, suspicion whatsoever. Uh, 286 career hitter, 256 home runs, scored over 1,300 runs, drove in over 1,100 RBIs, and has 305 stolen bases in his career. 111 career OPS plus, and this is a guy who won a gold glove, was a four-time all-star, but that's because he was playing in the National League with Willie Mays, Roberto Clemente, Frank Robinson, Hank Aaron. It's hard to make the all-star team and win the gold gloves when that's your competition. So Veda Pinson 
extremely overlooked, extremely deserving of the Hall of Fame, and a guy that I love to collect. I would vote for Veda Pinson way before I'd vote for Dick Allen. So <laughs> I'm with you, Dom. I'll take it. Hey, and he does meet one of my thresholds. Those 2,757 hits is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that is That's something. a heck of a lot of hits. And so what, know, what is what I mean, what's held him back? Is it the fact that all these other guys, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, just just completely he, he played in the around? most stacked outfielder era we've maybe ever seen. It but he didn't, he didn't no. get all the name recognition stuff that you'd like. Right. It definitely, so it definitely it held him back on the hardware perspective for sure. Yeah. And the recognition sure, but... of all stars and all that stuff. But also, like from a war perspective, when you've got all those guys in your era at your position, how are you going to separate from the league more? You know, when you've got elite mm -hmm. competition, because war right. is wins above replacement um, and comparable to the league uh, as you look more in depth at it. So that that's tough competition. It yeah, is. And if you look at, I mean, we're just just looking at his stats alone, I mean, 2,757 hits. I mean, that's damn near close to you know getting to that that uh, that prestigious level of the 3,000. 286 batting average. I get that he's kind of competing against a stacked outfield. 305 stolen bases. I mean, I understand like product of the times. You know, Hall of Fame writers then were looking at. Who he was go who he was matching up against, mm -hmm. but nowadays when you like nowadays with the writers, the different climate, different sort of mentality, different thought process. The veterans committee, I mean, they're gonna let these let a bunch of other guys in that have borderline. I mean, this guy, in my opinion, Pinson is crosses just like nudges himself over. Now, it shouldn't be how good am I compared to this guy? It should be what how like. What's my contribution to the game in terms of statistics? What did I do enough? Not so much accolades, but like again, 2,700 hits, 300 stolen bases, uh, a 287 batting average, which is favorable among a lot of voters. I mean, this guy should be in already. Yeah, a lot of the things about that outfielder era being so golden is like a lot of those guys are legends that are still talked about and heavily collected and beloved today. And we always talk about Frank Robinson being one of the most underrated players in baseball history. He is a true like top 20 player of all time, like amazing hitting stats and everything like that. He was overshadowed in that era. And Veda Pinson played on the same team as Frank Robinson. So he was overshadowed by the guy that was overshadowed by all the legends. He got completely kind of out in the shuffle. And I believe uh, Blitz Card said something again that he died young as well. So he wasn't someone that was signing at a bunch of shows and having those fan interactions and the stories of him being kept alive as much by him being at events and stuff like that. So I think that hasn't helped him either, especially now as the committees try to elect living candidates when possible. But Veda Pinson, as a pure statistic case, I agree with you. He is deserving. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. Small hall tendencies, again, Pinson's a miss for me, uh, but it, it's a narrow miss. It, like, if he got elected, I wouldn't be super upset about it. Um, but my next outfielder, and I, I don't think that uh, Scott may or may not still be in here uh, from Reindeer Studios, but this is the reason I chose to wear this hat, because I've been pro this player for years and years and so is uh, my good friend Frank uh, at Baseball Hall of Fame Autographs. Quick shout out to him. If you're still listening and you don't follow Frank, you should. Um, but this player, I've got a 2013 five-star, but it's Kenny Lofton. It's my autograph of Kenny Lofton. And I think it's an absolute travesty he fell off the ballot as quickly as he did. And this is why. Him being the leadoff hitter in that era, he was all about speed. And I think speed generally is underrated in the history of the game. Uh, I know Dom likes his threshold of 300 stolen bases is kind of an earmark there. Um, I like 500 as far as like a secondary qualifier. But I also collect, to kick it back to collecting for a second, uh, I collect what I call the 600 stolen base club, which I, I believe is a little more elite, if you will. Well, Kenny Lofton belongs to that with 622 stolen bases. He also has over 1,500 runs scored with 1,528. He was also just 72 hits away from 2,500. Uh, and 
he was a really good leadoff hitter for a lot of good teams uh, in that era that he played in in the 90s and you know early 2000s there. And I, I really believe Kenny Lofton was drastically overlooked. Uh, I tend to like speed players more than the average person or baseball fan. Uh, that's my style of play, so maybe I'm a little biased. Um, but I think Lofton should be a Hall of Famer. I, I really do. He's one of the ones I feel the most strong about on my list. I'm just, yeah, I'm taking a look because Kenny Lofton, his, yeah, I mean, 622 stolen bases tonight. I mean, pretty much right on cue is a 299 batting average. You can call it 300. I mean, might, might as well. Uh, so RBI is obviously 781 leadoff hitter. I mean, I'm trying to, who would we, who can we compare him to that is a Hall of Famer? Similar um, number. That's, I think, the tough thing for Kenny Lofton as a candidate is no matter who you compare him to with those like speed leadoff guys, it's, it's kind of tough. Um, Cause the guys like Tim Raines and Ricky Henderson just did like more on the base pads. And then guys like Lou Brock did more with the bat. Um, so that's, I think the one tough thing with Lofton, but I agree he got completely overshadowed and is one of the absolute worst one and done the BBWA has had. Uh, in recent memory, right up there with Lou Whitaker. Uh, I think those two were severe misses where they didn't get the 5% threshold to stay on the ballot after their first year when they're just really compelling cases, I think, both guys. Uh, never the top of the league superstar, but like consistently great for many years. Other than RBI, he's a decent comp to center fielder Hugh Duffy. Now, granted, he's a dead ball era player, um, mm -hmm. but... That's the first comp that I found that's fairly similar. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, some people are saying Minoso, but I think the stolen bases wouldn't be close. Yeah, on a on a guy like that's primarily you know speed steals all that, I think that would be the first place I would look for a, a comp. You know. Now this one, so the I'm not I'm not going by position. I'm going just by statistics alone. And I'm looking at – so this is where accolades separate a player, in my opinion. It's Kenny Lofton, six-time All-Star, four-time Gold Glove. And great, you know, great uh, great accolades there. Uh, you know, 1,528 runs, 622 stolen bases, 781 RBIs. Again, the batting average pretty much at 300, 2,428 hits. In terms of comparable numbers – this is where accolades separates the player. Ozzie Smith has similar numbers, a less, uh, not as good of a batting average, very similar in RBIs. He has sl slightly less stolen bases, very close in hits, pretty much right, right there. And um, Ozzie Smith has less home runs. But then you look at all of these amazing statistics: World Series champion, third time, thirteen times Gold Glove, championship Gold Glove, series man. MVP. This is where accolades separates it, the player. And, you know, that's the thing with uh, Kenny Lofton is that he just doesn't have the same amount of accolades, but the statistics are very similar. Uh, yeah. As far as war goes, I mean, the war is better with Ozzy Smith, uh, but they're close. 68 versus 77 or 76, roughly. And another thing with that comparison is Ozzy Smith, even though he did play for the Padres for a little bit to start his career, like he is known as one of the most popular players in Cardinals history, longtime Cardinal. Kenny Lofton bounced around. He did. Yeah. And I think that hurt Tim Raines' case. And I think Tim Raines is just a better Kenny Lofton type 100%. archetype case. So Tim Raines had a trouble getting into the Hall of Fame as well. That should be the number one thing you lead with going forward, Jake, for Kenny Lofton Hall of Fame talk. Just by the way, Mookie's dropping the nugs that we all need. I just dropped the uh, mic. That. I mean, but I think that Tim <laughs> Raines, it took him till his final year on the ballot to get elected, and uh, Kenny Lofton didn't get that chance to build on the ballot. So I, I hope he gets in one day, but he's, he's more of that like journeyman speedster type. Oh, man. I mean, Mookie, why do you got to do that, man? You got to do the guy dirty by, by like, he didn't do him dirty. That's a career accolade right there. We should have that's gonna be to that's gonna be on his Hall of Fame plaque. <laughs> it's going after they talk about his stolen bases. It's gonna be Lofton was a multiple time MTV Rock and Jock All Star. I can't oh, wait for man. Mickey to open for his speech. That's gonna be great. Oh, it's gonna be fantastic. 
All right, I think we're, we're at the last outfield position. We are at the end here, and I saw some uh, love for Bobby Bonds in the chat. Uh, Bobby Bonds is way closer to the Hall of Fame, I think, than people realize. Uh, oh, him Bobby and Bonds, right? yeah, him and Steve Finley are I both cases that. that I actually really like that didn't make my outfield today. They're both two of the nine players in baseball history with over 300 home runs and 300 stolen bases, uh, which I know Jake doesn't care about either of those numbers, but that combination of numbers is very rare to find. And Bobby Bonds and Steve Finley are both in that mold. So they're both very interesting Hall of Fame cases, but they didn't quite make my outfield. Uh, Willie Davis is also a Hall of Fame case that I'm very fond of uh, that didn't make it today, Reggie Smith. But my last spot, because I wanted to do a true right fielder, and it's a crime that this man, as bad as he's doing health-wise, is not in the Hall of Fame. I went with the Cobra, Dave Parker. He doesn't have the analytical war that you typically look for uh, in a Hall of Famer because he didn't necessarily age the best, but he, in many cases, is a peak case with compiling numbers. He won an MVP. He won three gold gloves. He won three silver sluggers, two batting titles. When the leaves turn brown, I will wear the batting crown. Dave Parker, all-star MVP with one of the most iconic throws in all-star history. Seven-time all-star, won a home run derby. But you look at the numbers, he had his problems with cocaine and missed some time. He came back, had a second place MVP finish, and finished his career with 2,712 hits, 339 career home runs, was a career 290 hitter, scored over 1,200 runs, and was seven run RBI shy of 1,500 RBIs, 121 career OPS plus, only 40 career war. Uh, he didn't age the best, but Dave Parker long deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And much like some of the players we talked about today, the thing that's keeping him out of the Hall of Fame uh, more than his performance is his personality. It's the it's the cocaine stuff. It's the jerk to the writer stuff. I think that is affecting Dave Parker's case more than anything. Uh, and he's a guy that should be in the Hall of Fame. And I hope he gets there while he's still with us. Sounds like a better version of Dick Allen. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I've said that before. Uh, no, I, I think Dave Parker is one of the uh, main guys when you talk about peak cases that are not mm -hmm. in the Hall of Fame. Uh, that if if that is something that you think warrants Hall of Fame candidacy, he's he's right there as far as a peak candidate. Um, I would not be surprised to see him get in, but I do think that if he does get in, I really hope that he is put in while he is still with us and he gets to have that day in the sun, gets to give the Hall of Fame speech. Um, and I, I think a big part, uh, we've talked about this before, but I think a big part of the Hall of Fame adjusting uh, the way they do things with the air committees is going to allow some of these living guys to get in faster. Um, so hopefully that'll happen. I almost thought we were going to pick the same guy when you eliminated some of the other ones, um, because my player is a guy uh, we both uh, really are in favor of. Uh, and we've talked about this on an episode of cracking Cooperstown and so much so that I, I put my money where my mouth is and I went out and bought some of his cards because uh, I didn't have any. But it's from your team. Yep. You went with three center fielders in the outfield. Sure did. I love my speed. Uh, so does Dave Parker. Ooh, ouch, too soon. Uh, Johnny Damon. Uh, here's my autograph of him of a uh, Topps Chrome issue here. And the reason I chose Mr. Johnny Damon is because he has over 2,500 hits. He has 2,769, which is in that Veda Pinson range uh, if you guys are keeping score at home. However, for Johnny Damon, he also has over 1,500 plus runs. He has 1,668 to go along with 408 stolen bases. So while not quite to 500, uh, he still did crack 400, has over 1,000 RBIs. Uh, he also has a, a good narrative. Uh, he was part of that, you know, changing of the curse era for the Boston Red Sox. Maybe he's got a little positivity going for him there. Uh, I think if he would have hung on for another year or two and cracked 3,000, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, I really think he's a, a forgotten candidate. Like, who's talking about Johnny Damon as being a borderline case, not even being a Hall of Famer? 
but as a borderline case, is anybody talking about Johnny Damon? And I, I believe that we should uh, at least have a conversation about him. Uh, I know what Dom thinks because we've already talked about this. So, Sammy, when we kind of present Johnny Damon as a borderline or potential Hall of Famer, w- what are your first thoughts? I'm so, I didn't think he had as many hits as he did. Um, I thought he had way less, to be honest with you, but that, that caught me by surprise. Um, I mean, listen, his statistics are very good, 284. I mean, almost 1,700 runs, uh, 408 stolen bases. I mean, these are all very well-balanced statistics that kind of give you the um, the – all the reason to vote vote you in. Um, 284 batting average, 235 home run. So he he was able to kind of do it all. He was able to hit for, for contact, hit for power when needed, run the bases very well. Um, you know, World, World Series champion two times. It's just the accolades are not there for him. But, you know, because, I mean, he was overshadowed by some other guys, you know, um, so it's kind of hard for him to be a standout, but then again, I mean, you have a lot of guys in in the past that were not the number one hitters on a team that got into the Hall of Fame. So it's a yeah, that's a good pick. I, I'm just surprised. I didn't think he had that many hits. Yeah, I think Johnny Damon. Uh, unfortunately, the most recent he's been in the news was that really ugly DUI that he had a few years back, and that definitely hasn't helped him with the jerkitis. Uh, that he was kind of already dealing with. Uh, but I, I think that if he stayed the long hair, lovable guy in Boston for the long term, uh, that could have helped him uh, image wise. Uh, it's it's still weird to me seeing him with the short hair uh, with the Yankees yes. and the Rays at the end. Um, but I, I agree with Chris. Uh, his arm was not the best, especially for a guy that played center field. Uh, and he's someone that his career OPS plus is only 104. So he was like just above league average over the course of his career. He obviously had some highs in there. Uh, He's someone that, like you said, Jake, is just a case that doesn't get talked about enough. And I think that's the biggest problem with outfield. See, you picked three center fielders. I could have done the same thing. I love Veda Pinson. I love Willie Davis. I like Kenny Lofton. I like Johnny Damon. I like Andrew Jones. Like there's a ton of center fielders too, which is arguably the most stacked position in baseball history. If you look at the all-time wars leaders at center field, there's a lot of heavy hitters. I've seen some Dwight Evans love, which I didn't mention him in my honorable mentions, but I pulled the card and I showed it. I'll show it again. Dwight Evans is really damn close. uh, And I think he'll get into the hall of fame one day too, but he's a lot healthier than Dave Parker is at the moment. So I wanted to kind of show my love for the Cobra. So I think he should be the next right fielder to get in over Evans, but Evans also really amazing case the outfield is super deep and part of that is because each team plays three or four guys uh, in the outfield so there's a lot more opportunities for outfielders to break out become everyday guys and put together considerable cases that might be hall of fame worthy Uh, so johnny damon i think that and dave parker is a nice way to close it out is two guys that we believe should be in or get more consideration at the very least absolutely i was just kind of going through a list of different players that are like the all-time hits and um i was just i came across uh, luis gonzalez hmm. gonzo's numbers are pretty interesting but yeah uh, he got busted for steroids unfortunately oh um, he did okay so he's off my board but he statistically his numbers are there if like jake said they start electing players that got busted anyway he could get consideration down the line i didn't i didn't realize that he was he was a part of that Interesting. Yeah, he actually served a suspension for steroids. Oh, okay. Well, that there you go. All right. Well, that's a good way to finish. Gonzo's, yeah. So chasing major, chasing majors. Yeah, Gonzo's a roid guy. Too many of them, it seems. Uh, so this is interesting. There were no overlaps in your picks, and a mysterious, uh, mysterious hole in Jake's lineup for second base. <laughs> Yeah, Veda Pinson's just going to keep knocking base knocks right past the hole at second base, and I'm going to beat him. So it's going to be a fun game. He he can stop. He doesn't have to reach 3,000 because he's still got like 600 more than Dick Allen. <laughs> uh, I love how he's, tr- he's inval- trying to invalidate the Dick Allen pick with every single pick that he's made. Um, but, 
you know, that's part of the fun with the Hall of Fame is like, we don't have to agree on every single candidate. The Hall of Fame voters don't agree on every single candidate, whether it's a slam dunk, uh, like Babe Ruth or Joe DiMaggio that doesn't get in first ballot. Uh, like there's so many cases over the years where not everyone can agree. And that's why the Baseball Hall of Fame, despite its flaws, is the sanctity that it is. It's hard to get that 75% threshold to get elected. It's the hardest one to get into. It's the most prestigious uh, and one of the oldest ones. So. Uh, it, it's something that me and Jacob are both super passionate about, and we love diving into these discussions. And today was a great example of that because these guys, especially on my end, I didn't pick anybody that was uh, still on the ballot or going to be on the ballot. Uh, these guys that are overlooked in the history of the game for one reason or the other, whether it's potential steroids, being a jerk, uh, overshadowed by teammates. Uh, the game was looked at differently back then, like a Ken Boyer. There's so many different ways to go back into the history of baseball. And what's great is I showed all these rookie cards today. You can go and get these guys that are considered semi-stars right now that have better numbers in certain categories than Hall of Famers for a bargain. So uh, definitely do your own research, find some guys that you believe in as possible future Hall of Famers and go out there and get their rookie cards and autographs now because when they get in, there is a bump. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, um, if you guys want to uh, just mention again, um, the show and where it can be found and just because we have what 39 people here so for though mm -hmm. any of those 39 that haven't watched yet it's a good, good opportunity to do so yeah so cracking cooperstown uh, is our podcast uh dom releases those on other platforms but here on youtube uh it's on my channel over at legends never die uh we've done how many episodes are we are deep now dom like five six we've done five five okay yeah, we're actually going to record one next week, so there'll be one coming out here in the coming weeks if you guys want to check that out. Um, you can reach me at Legends Never Die uh, or on Instagram if you want to message me there. Um, I'm at Legends Never Die Collection. Uh, Dom, you can let them know where to find you. Yeah, and uh, I'm Dom, same in sports cards on YouTube and Instagram. And me and Jake say this at the end of every episode, but leave comments. Uh, on this video, on past episodes of Cracking Cooperstown, or DM us on Instagram. We're always willing to talk Hall of Fame. We do it in our free time a lot already. And we love talking about these cases and debating back and forth and diving into things. Uh, it's, it's just so rewarding. I say it all the time with, vin with vintage cards, especially. Uh, the research is half the fun. Uh, I, I love diving into these cases and, and really trying to unearth uh, the stuff that's overlooked in the hobby and in baseball in the Hall of Fame. So definitely hit us up there and uh, check out the show both on YouTube as well as Spotify for audio only guys. That's how I've been listening is through the Spotify app on those long drives and uh, definitely, definitely engaging. I mean, like I mentioned before, I listened to the catcher episode. I was waiting for months to get mentioned and I had to wait the entire episode, which drove me nuts. But that's that's that producer brain right there. I was actually, you guys, uh, I can't remember. Did you guys mention Del Crand a little or no? He did not get a uh, blind oh, resume, okay. but so he, he has an interesting catcher case as well. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you guys again for doing this. Uh, it kind of, I mean, it pretty much felt like an, uh, an episode you guys would record. So that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the greatest thing is that, you know, you guys are able to go off the cuff and just, come, you know, go back and forth. And uh, I think that makes a good recipe for a podcast. So I look forward to the next one, which, as you mentioned, will be next week. And so thanks, everybody, for jumping on. Thanks for those that participated in the chat. Uh, definitely made a huge difference in being able to kind of drive this dialogue. So I uh, want to thank everybody. And um, hope everybody had a great weekend. Got some cards, maybe. Um, if not, there's always next weekend. So uh, thank you guys so much. You guys have a great night. We are for collectors. Subscribe. Uh, subscribe to Legends Ever Die. Subscribe to Steven Sports Cards. And if you have time, you can stop by my channel, Sammy Thunder. But that's okay. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs>